Hi, I'm Esmen and welcome to this video lecture on loading and displaying raster data in ArcGIS. In this video lecture I will talk about the most common data formats or file formats of raster data and then I will talk about the most common ways of displaying them. So I will talk about how we display terrain model, be it sur surface model or terrain. I'll talk about scanned maps. I'll talk about auto photos, satellite imagery. So you should have a relatively good idea of the most common ways of displaying data on raster data when this lecture is over. So, first of all, the most common raster formats. Raster formats are different from the vector formats in that they are general purpose formats. They are file formats like TIFF and JPEG that are file formats we meet in everyday life on a computer, so digital images. The only difference is that we in the when using them for geospatial data or geodata, we ensure that there is a little header file either included in the file or as a file next to it with the same name but a different extension that defines where the world it, the data is, the coordinates if you wish, and the projection and the size of the individual grid cells. So how large are the grid cells in mapping units, meters or whatever you're using. So TIFF files and JPEG files are almost standard files. They have a little bit of a, a twist that ensure that they can display correctly in the GIS connection together with our GIS layers. But otherwise they are standard and the same problems apply to them that JPEG is a loss format. So you can have the same data in a TIFF and in a JPEG and the JPEG will be much smaller because it uses a compression algorithm but the compression algorithm that the JPEG uses is a loss format. It normally doesn't have so much influence on photographs so also photo, but when we're talking about scanned maps that are typically very sharp in their color scheme, so we have a strictly black line on a white background, we typically get shadows from the compression algorithm when using JPEG. So JPEGs, oh yeah, they can be used, but I would only recommend using them for photographs, uh, or aerial photographs, or auto photo, and the like. Um, not for doing any analysis on it because the data in them is changed through the compression algorithm and not for scanned maps because of the sharp black and white contrast we have on scanned maps. TIFF files are typically uncompressed or using a lossless compression algorithm so they are fine also for um, scanned maps. As for grid files um, they are still around they are losing their market share radically because they take up a lot of space and they can only be read by geospatial software as opposed to TIFF and JPEG that you can read in any software and look what is there. So they are there and they are mainly there because of historical reasons that old things that started in it say the 70s, 80s, they typically still have ESRI grid data um, lying around but it is becoming less and less common. Then we have one of those that are specific to um, the geospatial community is enhanced compression wavelets, which is a very advanced compression algorithm. Um, it's a proprietary, and that means that you have, if you want to be able to write the format, 
you'll have to uh, pay a lot of money um, and you typically have to uh, download specific uh, extra add-ons in order to use them not in ArcGIS uh, ArcGIS has the ability to read these ECW files um, included in it but uh, in our software you'll typically have to download an extra add-on in order to read these files but they are very efficient in their compression and again they are primarily used for image data not for scanned maps NetCDF um, is a multi-dimensional data format so it can have both time, space, elevation as well as latitude and longitude and a lot of different attributes in it it's a, um, a also a highly compressed format um, but it doesn't use it's a lossless compression it uses some very nifty conversions in order to minimize how much space uh, it takes up to store the data ArcMap or ArcGIS can't read them directly or use them directly you have to convert them to a raster layer in order to use them but they are uh, becoming very commonly used especially when uh, climate modeling because of the ability to handle these um, multi-dimensional elements all of these formats can contain one or more raster layers so you can have if it's a train model you will typically have only one layer if it's a aerial photograph or autophoto you'll typically have three layers red green and blue if it's a satellite you can have many layers and all of these formats are capable of handling many layers how do we display them i'll talk about in this order i'll talk about how to display a single band and we'll first start out with those that have integer data so RAS data with integer how do we handle them I'll use two examples I will first of all start out with a Korean data set so Korean is an EU land cover mapping project and uh, I've got them down here and I'll load this one here so what we noticed is as opposed to what we are used to in vector data ArcMap loads the data with a color scheme it already has the correct assigned colors to each pixel this is because this is what we call a pseudo color or color mapped image so we have only a limited number of integer values and they are then in the file assigned a specific RGB value if you look at the layer in our catalog here and look at properties you will see that you get information about the layer what type of it is a file system and is this not in a database how many rows how many columns it only has one layer each pixel is 100 by 100 meters it will take up 2.78 gigabytes it's in the TIFF format, it's a thematic map here it says that it's using unassigned integers so we're using 8-bit to assign the colors of the layer and 8-bit gives us ability to handle 256 different values so from 0 to 255 so th this is the maximum different number of classes we can have in an 8-bit unassigned integer unassigned means that there's no negative values it has a color map that is preset so it has an embedded color map in it okay. then it has pyramids which means that we can zoom in and out this is a compression algorithm that's used the extent of it, the spatial data and the statistics of the one band that it has so the minimum value is 1 and the maximum value is 44 and then mean and standard deviations 
and uh, at the moment there's no transformation on it. So that's the information we get by looking at the properties in our catalog. So I right clicked on it and said properties and then that gave me all that information about the layer. If I look at it in the table of contents, I can expand it and I can see these are the different colors and the value in the raster layer they are signed on it. I can right click properties in here and I can see that it is a color map. I can go in and change the color map by clicking on the individual colors and assigning a new color. That would be silly, but I can. And I can then change it to another category. And um, it has a series of different types of display, as we know from the vector data. Um, they are a bit different, and some of them make sense, some of them don't in this connection. Um, we can have discrete colors that just assign a series of random colors to it. It doesn't really make sense. Stretched is something we use when we have a continuous data set, such as elevation data, we'll cover that in a moment. Classified, I can classify the data just like I can do in vector data. So I can create a class for all the values from one to seven and give them a color um, scheme and then from seven to and so on, create the number of classes I want. Again, it doesn't really make sense in this type of data because each class has its unique value. I can go up and say instead of using my color map, I can use unique values. The advantage of that is that I can assign labels to them. In my color map, I, did, I have the numbers here and I can go in and type them, but, uh, but I give, give them a text label. But in the classified one, we have, so in the unique values, we have um, the extra ability of using standard methods. This unique one here only works if our data layer here has a attribute table. You can look here, I can see um, open attribute table. You say, well, don't every file have that? No, not necessarily. If I look at another data set that uh, is of the same type, I have created this one here. This is a scanned uh, map. And um, we can see, if we look at the properties of it, that it is again one band. They are now 10 by 10 meters. This is the size of them. And again, they are on assigned integers. And there are in the statistics, I haven't calculated statistics on it, no, fine. So I can say, okay, if I go into my table of contents and zoom to this layer, this, you can see it has lots of colors. Um, it might look just like a standard image, but it is only one layer, layer so it, it is a color map, which we again can see if we go and look at its properties. We can see that we are in color map, so a solo color. So these are the colors assigned to the different values of the of the scanning, if you wish. And here, if I go and say, I can't go up and say unique, because this one will then say, oh, oh, no attribute table. So this layer here has not created an attribute table on it. And that's common for this type of layers that they do not have attribute tables and therefore there's a lot of ordinance we can't really do with them. But if they have an attribute table as our one has, this one over here, our Corinth data set, I can go down and say a property symbology, unique values. I can again assign the colors, that's not really interesting. What I'm interested is I'm interested in loading a um, layer file. So I've got two layers for it. I've got the code and I've got it with the name. So if I say add, I choose my new legend. And now I've got 
Well, the same color scheme, but with the, with the text associated with them that represents the text of the class in the Korean. So now instead of having the values of the file, I now have the associated categories and with their um, English description. So that's working with having um, a single band with a limited number, so we're using integer. So we typically it's only an 8 bit, so it's really a byte. So we can only have 250 colors, that's 56 colors. So that's a standard for these limited data sets. They have, I mean, now I'll display them as unique values. If we have a um, attribute table, it, it's, if it's not there, you, as you said, ArcMap can make it, create it. Um, or we can use total color mapping, which is a way of compressing a file, um, for, for typically from a scanned file. If you could see if we looked at compared um, our two files, this one here, which was a size of six megabytes compared to the one, this one here, which has the same data in it, it's exactly the same file, but it's stored as a free color RGB here. It takes up about three times as much. Not surprisingly, because this is free time on the side integers. So, we, by changing to soda colors in this type of scanned images, we can reduce the size by to one third, which, if you have scanned maps of all of them up, is an important factor to include. So, Integer values are typically used for classified satellite imagery as a Korean, where each value has a unique meaning, a class value, urban, agricultural area, so on. We can assign colors to them using color map or solo colors. If they have an attribute table, we can handle this unique value system and then use standard layer file with legends and so on in them. There are also data sets who have many different values, so you can think of them as being continuous in their values. And we have decimal values, or real numbers if you wish, and uh, they have another set of display possibilities. This type of data is typically um, terrain model data, or any other form of interpolator, so um, density data, uh, this type of data that is continuous. If I just clear my project here and uh, then load another data set in, namely this DTM. We have two data sets here. We have a DTM, digital terrain model, and a DSM, digital surface model. They start with the digital train model. So this is the digital train model of Copenhagen. So the train is the surface that we walk on, if you wish. I can zoom in on it somewhere. Um, so this is the, the surface, the ground layer. It does not contain buildings, houses, uh, buildings, trees, the like. Of course, what is the terrain where the buildings are? Well, that's a bit of a guess. So, it is a they have invented some values underneath there. Then we have this DSM, the surface model, and here you can see all the trees and all the buildings. So that's the difference between the DSM and the DTM. Surface is whatever is the highest building, chimney, cranes, trees, whatever and the DTM, that is the terrain. In principle, all moving objects should have been removed. So, oh no, there shouldn't be any cows, cars, and the like. But, of course, that's not quite succeeded. There are remnants of that type of objects in this data set. So, DSM, DTM. 
They are both, if you look at the values out here in the properties, we can now see that they have one band still. These are 0.4 by 0.4 meters, so 40 by 40 centimeters. They have a the floating point real numbers, so over 32 bit. And then they have this special one I've mentioned earlier in another video, this no value data. In this case, no value is assigned to minus 9999. So if the pixel has this value, it's considered as no data. So data placement and we have no observations. Again, we have some pyramids that helps us zoom in and out. We have our coordinate system and we have some statistic information about the distribution of the data in it. This type of data can be displayed in many ways. So I can um, go up in my properties. It won't really make any idea to make a color map here because there are too many different unique values and this, uh, discrete uh, colors. Again, it would give a sign some colors, but they won't be unique. We have, um, so don't try and do these things. They will run out of, of um, possibilities very quickly and to get an error message. We can have our classified here and we can have stretched. These are the two that we typically use. If we look at the stretched, we have um, some different ways of stretching it. We can see we have here it's displayed as going from black to white, but we could, because it is elevation data, we could use a elevation color scheme as this one that goes from green over to yellow red, so go to white at the snow at the top of the mountains and apply this color scheme. So here we have we have all the high values um, in the red and white colors and in the low values in the screen colors. Um, now we can then look around at this data set. We can um, do other things also in this data type of data. We can look at how we, um, I just change it back to a black and white. Uh, we can change how we s distribute our colors. I ask, if I just say apply like this, it might be difficult to see. We don't have the total black and we don't have the total white because we are assigning these colors based on the entire data set. If I ever go down here and say from display extent, and then apply, you can see that it optimizes the use of colors to that area that we have displayed. So when I, whenever I have, whatever zoom I have, I will have somewhere on my image a whole, total black and a total white. Even if I go in and zoom on something that looks relatively dark here, you see, it will then optimize the colors, change the colors in order to give us the most variation within this scene. So that was ability, if you go down here and say properties and then use this value we have here that we calculate from the current display instead of having from the entire data set. This value here decides on how it performs what we call a stretch or a mapping of the input data to the output data. We have different possibilities. Uh, minimum and maximum disk cuts to the minimum and maximum values. Percent clip does almost the same, but just removes the top 2% and the bottom 2%, typically because we expect them to be noise. We can use a standard deviation if the dataset was normally distributed, 
or we can use the one that is commonly used, the histogram equalization. It's a distribution based on how common a range is so that we have the most variation where we have most different uh, values. However, this can't really be used in um, floating points. So we can't, you can't, it, we can do this, but we can't see the histogram. So these are different ways of stretching the color. Uh, minimum, maximum will typically be used in this situation. Uh, histograms are more primarily used if it's satellite imagery and things like that where we're looking at variations. So that's um, our display possibilities by just looking at our layer. Of course we had this thing about ability to assign different a color scheme to it. Um, this elevation one here. And then it has this one that is important. It, we can use what is called a hill shade effect. So we can pretend that we have a light source and it will create an artificial shading on our layer. Um, so we get some, some shade effects. It, is, it looks relatively nice in this version here. Um, so we get the, a not so dominant but a, a partly shading effect. If we really want to, um, to make a display that can show elevation, ArcMap has an extra little tool uh, up under Windows, which is called Image Analysis, which is where we have, as it says, data for doing image analysis. And one of the tools we have here is that I can choose my TSM, and then I can here, down here, it has a hill shade algorithm. And this one is a bit more harsh, creates a bit more dense shadows, as you can see, heavier shadows. So we can really get a, um, a good visual on our data sets compared to either the black and white, the colored version, or the one that has this dense shading effect on it. And we can re because we have such a high resolution on our data set, we can really pick up details such as roof windows and things like that. And as you see, not all cars have been removed from these data sets here. So that was the display of data using real floating values. So you can use them as classifier, with a uh, you know, hill shade, we can make stretched, but we can also make these classified. An example of using classified could be if we go back here and uh, turn off all these nice colors here and say what's really our concern is um, how Copenhagen will deal with uh, global warming and changing of the sea level. So how large areas of Copenhagen are really in threat. First of all, we get a wee bit worried when we look at this data set and we see that the data set is at the lowest place in Copenhagen is 10 meters below sea level. So of course, if water just run, could run in if it was lower than zero, that would be flooded. And of course, that's not the case. If there is a wall or a dam or something containing the seawater, it will not fill these holes. These holes are, I guess it's the ch where the tunnel dips down to um, the Sweden connection. So where we go on the tunnel to Sweden, there's probably a hole about minus 10 meters there. But if you want to say, okay, there are probably also other things than, than artificial holes that are low land, and we do not have dams as such around Copenhagen. So where do we really have threats that we should worry about? If I go in and say classified here, I can now go in and choose my classes. Say, okay, um, and I can choose a color scheme. 
how I can choose individual colors. First of all, I might probably want to change some of these um, cut mills. At the moment, I have one at two, so it goes from minus 10 to 2. I'll just set that at 0 and I'll put a 2 meters and a 4 meters and a 8 meters interval and then over there I don't really care in this situation okay and these are already subsurface these are really close to the water surface these are not quite so close these are upon dry land and these are high up so what we can see is that as I talked about this is the motor road and where it's been dug down so this is where it crosses to, to Sweden we have the water of course the harbour and the lake layer here which is um, all at zero of course then we have Vestama where we have quite a lot of really low lying areas um, again sub subsurface or sub sea level um, areas because that is an in dam dammed area we have the dam running down here um, and then we have quite a lot of Copenhagen which is in this blue color here and uh, these are then areas that would really be under threat of um, having potential problems in a sea rise of two meters which is in many of the climate models something we must expect so these are things we should be worried about and that we can display that easily by setting up our classification on our color scheme here so that color color covered the last of these uh, multi-value where we have lots of values and uh, typical decimal values so and they are typically train models that we work with in this situation multi-band raster so band, the raster layers that consist of more raster files that consist of more than one layer they are typically aerial photographs, satellite imagery and the like. So let's look at how they are processed. Um, I'll just clear this away. And look at an example of this type of data. Um, the most common one is a, let's take an aerial photograph. This is this, this ECW file type. It's a very compressed file and here we have a high resolution aerial photograph of the whole of Copenhagen and it is relatively high resolution. Let's look up here. So here we have the harbour and the individual boats in the harbour quite clearly seen. This type of data I can go in and, um, and change it so I have the same layers as before I can go in and say stretch however that doesn't really make much sense in this situation and I can also have something new here where I can have RGB composition so this is where I assign the different layers to the colors of my monitor in this case there's a red layer that is assigned to the red color there's a green layer assigned to the green color there's a blue layer assigned to the blue color and I can go down and I can do the things that we did before about stretching however do not try and change it on this type of data they have been processed already to be optimal as aerial photographs so there's not really much to gain by trying to fool around with changing the classification of this type of data but it is a RGB. One thing you should be aware of when you have multi-layer data is that if you go in and then you double click on this one, it will open up and you then can open 
just the blue layer. So I could add this to the blue layer here. That's a black and white image. So this is just the blue component of this RGB layer. So inside of these that have multiple layers, we have a layer for each color. And be aware, do not try and load them as we normally do by double click. That doesn't work. You'll have to draw, drag them in on the sheet, uh, on the display here, instead of double clicking on them. Double click will not work on this type of data set. However, if we look at another one, it is my satellite imagery. This is from the Landsat 8 satellite. You can see here I have seven different bands. Um, some of them, there's more in the Landsat 8, but this was what I was using for this specific purpose. So here we have a series of different bands. And these are, the, say, the original satellite data. So they have not been processed and we'll typically need to do something about them in order to achieve a, a reasonable display. So I'll be looking at that now. I'll just load them and um, change to my table of contents and get rid of my different things here. Get rid of that one and that one. Don't need them anymore. And zoom to this layer here. This is the middle of Zealand. This is the town of Frankster. We have Langsø up here. So, but you might wonder, oh dear, even if I do zoom in a bit closer, do we have pink or mauve fields in Denmark? No, we do not have lavender fields in Denmark. Um, so what is going on here? Well, the answer to that lies in this RGB thing. Because the question is, what is assigned to the red, the green and the blue color on the monitor? Here we have band one of the satellite, um, which is a um, bluish band, really, um, assigned to the red. So that doesn't really make sense. Um, this is these colors are not the ones that we'll expect if we wanted to look at um, if uh, as if it was a aerial photograph. If you want to have what we call natural colors on the Landsat, we will have a band assignment which is called not four, three, two. That's a band assignment that gives us natural color or natural looking colors um, from the land site imagery. Here we can see that this data is not really very optimized. So in this case I can go in and choose one of these optimizations, histogram applicate, and it will optimize it. And then what it does not, it doesn't try to optimize it to, hey, make this look natural. It optimizes to show as much as the variation as possible. So we have these different ones we can choose. And you can see that they have a large effect here. And also here, because they are integer values, if we looked in our catalog on this one, you could see that the properties of this is that it has seven bands of unassigned integer. So each band can have values between 0 and 255. And therefore, I have the ability to use the histogram tool here. Histogram will show me the histogram here for the red color, the green color, and the blue color. So this is the distribution of the data. And you can see most of our pixels have very low values. So if we want to make an optimal display of it, we will change this line here, which is a translation line between input, which we have um, up here, and then our output we had over here. So if I go up here and say OK, what you now can see is that it has transform this shape here 
to the one that's here. Okay. So this is given this little transformation here. We have optimized. I've used as much as my red color to display this relatively area instead of distributing my from 0 to 250 over all of this area. I have distributed my two, 0 to 250 over this area. So that wasn't optimal for my red. And I will do something like that for the green. And something like that for the blue color. So, and that then gives me this data set. Okay. So, this is um, our optimal display of this data set here. I can also, if I use one of those automatic ones, so I stick with my histogram equalization, and I can then use from my display. And what happens then is that if I now zoom in on one of those darker areas, so this forest area up here, you can see that it will, what before looked as one dark area, will now come up with lots of different coloring because it has optimized all of the colors in this little area here. So that's the effect of having a, and you see as I zoom out, this becomes more and more one dark blob. So that is the effect of using my display from the uh, optimize from the display add values. Now we're talking about uh, satellite imagery. In satellite imagery we typically use what we call a false color and a typically used false color to look at vegetation would be this band assignment 543. So this is our near infrared, our red and our green color assigned so that near infrared is red, red is green, and green is blue. So here we have all our different values. Um, and here we can see clearly these vegetated forest areas as being these dark red areas. So working with multiple bands, the question is how which band we assign from our data set we assign to which color on our monitor that's where this type of data is different from from the other ones otherwise they are exactly the same tools so that was that for this introduction lecture on displaying raster in uh, ArcGIS hope you liked it see you bye